portion of scripture I'm going to share with you today is one of those peaks, <coughs> one of the great chapters of the Bible. And it's back on the book of Psalms, it's the largest book in the Bible, with 150 chapters, 43,743 words, the biggest book in the Bible, it contains the longest chapter in the Bible, the shortest chapter in the Bible, the middle chapter in the Bible, and the middle verse in the Bible. It was quoted, over half of the New Testament quotations are from the Psalms. Jesus quoted the Psalms twice when he was on the cross. It contains every experience that a human being will ever know. It's found in the book of Psalms. And the psalm we're going to look at today is the psalm of David, Psalm 103. If you want to turn to it and follow along with me. Psalm 103 is an acrostic psalm. It's 22 verses. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So each verse begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's about a dozen acrostic psalms in the book of Psalms. It was a favorite memorization technique that was used to learn the scriptures. And the psalm is unique for a number of reasons. First of all, there's not a request in it. There's no prayer. There's no, no supplication. In it. It's all praise. Every one of the 22 verses is thinking about who God is, what God said, what God did, his enormous, his grace, his wonder, his mercy, and his goodness to us. It is an explosion. It was written at the end of David's life. When he was coming to the end of his life, he was looking back on how faithful God had been. And he wrote a letter at the end of his life describing how God had been to him. <clears throat> and I wonder, when we come to the end of our lives, if we had to sit down and write a letter, could we write one like this? Every one of us could. Should be able to write a letter like this, but we're about to hear today. In a funny way, it's almost like a sandwich that occurred to me in driving here today. Uh, the first words of Psalm 103 are, Bless the Lord, O my soul. The last words of Psalm 103 are, Bless the Lord, O my soul. There's two pieces of bread. In the middle, it's all these meat and vegetables, all these <laughs> nutritional truths that are packed in there, <clears throat> this beautiful package. I'm just going to go through this and expound upon it as the Lord directs. So if you want to follow along with me, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. The word bless means to bow down, to kneel in reverence and gratitude. Now, the Hebrew word is barach. That form of it is also pronounced baruch when it's a more aggressive verb. But David knew something about blessing the Lord. Uh, he had more trouble in his life than Solomon did. David's life was nothing but strife and trouble and difficulties. Yet his, all of his writings are full of praise. <laughs> Solomon had it easy. And all of his writings are full of despair and, and cynicism and doubt. It's really funny how these two men reacted so differently. But towards the end of his life, David prayed this prayer, and I quoted this once before a few weeks ago. Wherefore David blessed the Lord, he had a habit of doing that, before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great, and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Do you feel a heart forgotten in those words? I can scarce read it without feeling a little bit of an uplift and pull from heaven itself. David knew the God of goodness. And look about me in a world of people rolling in the wreckage of their own broken dreams living miserable lives, half alive, half dead. And it doesn't have to be that way. This God's a God of life and joy and peace and purpose and energy and good things. And he desires all of his children to have that. All of you who here are saved and aren't, and all those people out there that are stumbling through to an inevitable destruction at the end of their lives, and God wants to bless. And it's all in that psalm, bless the Lord. And all that is within me, spirit, soul, and body, everything, give thanks to him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He says that because we tend to forget. We are forgetful people. 
You know, uh, Deuteronomy is full of admonitions from God for us to remember the goodness of God. We, we tend to forget. We go about our, our business in the day, and it's not very long before we've forgotten uh, all about him. Uh, <coughs> before. Take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thy eyes have seen. We tend to forget, and to be silent over God's mercies is to incur the insult of ingratitude, not to thank him. It's to be ungrateful. There's a scripture I always like, I always minister at Thanksgiving time in Deuteronomy. It says, Beware, lest when thou hast eaten and thou art full, that thou forgettest the Lord thy God. Now, think about this. We always say a little blessing over the food for Thanksgiving. How many of you said, thank you, Lord, that was a great deal at the end of it, right? <laughs> I'm guilty. We're probably, I'm not going to ask for it. We're probably all guilty of that. But he says, remember, when the blessings are gone, just still thank him for it. Mm. So we can start right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to thank God for every Thanksgiving meal we've had all of our lives up to now. Amen. Amen. Okay, we've got that covered. Now we have to start next Thanksgiving. Remember to always we go, we go ahead. Forget not all that his benefits. You know, I was talking with this pastor on the phone yesterday, and uh, he was talking about how there's 23 pulpits in this area they don't have uh, pastors for. And he was talking about part of it is that they don't pay them anything. You know, and I said, well, pastors need to remember that it's not the salary you're after, it's the retirement plan. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one that that's the benefits. And then he lists some of these benefits. And there's, uh, there's so many of them here. The first one, and there's a reason why this is the first one, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. That's your sins. All it takes is one sin to be unforgiven, and you got a one-way ticket punch to hell. That's the way it is. Sin, sin condemns us. Christ came to take away that. He's forgiven us all of our iniquities. And I like the fact that it says all. One of my favorite verses on that subject is in 1 John 1. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. All. A-L-L. -L, one syllable means the same thing in Greek and Hebrew and English. Now, how would you feel if I just read to you who cleanses us from some sins? Whoops. How can you be sure what sins he does if he doesn't tell you? You don't have to worry about it. It doesn't make a difference what you've done from this day in the past of your life. How many sins, how you pile them up like a mountain. And this verse washes it away. All sins are forgiven. That's what we need most. The world needs most is forgiveness of its sins. Unforgiven sin is condemnation. We're born condemned. We're born without Christ. We have to be born again. That's why he, he came to give us that new life. We were talking Wednesday night about Sarah and how she was buried in the cave of Machpelah. And Abraham arranged for that. And when she went in the ground and they purchased... They purchased that ground. That's the first piece of Israel that title was owned for the kingdom of God. And even as Christ was in the tomb for a short period of time and came out of it, he purchased the whole earth by that act. You know, this, 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 this unforgiven sin, if we can express our sins, verse 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that word cleanse, that, here we go again. If you ever thank God for a future perfect tense verb, it's a future perfect future perfect, continuous action. It has cleansed you, it is cleaning, and if you commit any sins tomorrow, the blood of Christ has already covered it. How many of your sins that you committed were unforgiven when Christ died on the cross? <clears throat> All of them. Right? So it's already gone forward and covered that. Do you follow me? When he died, he says, it is finished. To tell us that, oh, it is completed, accomplished, paid in full. That covers everything you've ever done. And it keeps rolling on we talk once about how many drops of blood were shed and how many were needed and how many billions and billions of people. So there's plenty of room at the cross. So that, that thing about he forgives all your iniquities. I'm so glad to know that. Now keep, this keeps popping in my mind. I don't know why it is. I used to see that, that bumper sticker that Christians, Christians uh, aren't perfect and just forgiven. And it used to make me think it's kind of a cop out. It doesn't mean Christians would go on sinning. But the more I think about it, no, that's a good thing. I'm not perfect, but I am forgiven. And if I make a mistake tomorrow, I'll be forgiven tomorrow. I'm endeavoring to lead a holy life, and all of you should too. We should walk in cleanliness and purity of heart and soul. 
that's pleasing unto him. And there's power and blessings in that. But if you, if you make a mistake, you're covered. How can you not thank God for this kind of goodness? Who healeth all thy diseases? Well, I'm not going to get into that too much because I think it's, it's a one subject in the church that really needs to be taught on. And I'm going to be teaching on it as we go along. When Christ died on the cross, by his stripes you are healed. It doesn't say you were healed or you're going to be, you are. I believe the church today is not availing itself of the healing power that's there for them. Because they don't know what the word of God says. And they don't pray in faith and minister and don't teach it. Or they make a mess of it. You've got these guys in $500 silk suits, suits with two jets and a home in Hawaii. And they're making money off of this. They're going to have to answer to God. There's fakes and flakes and phonies out there. There's false pastors out there. There's all kinds of bad stuff out there. But there's also the true church of Jesus Christ out there. There's also men and women of God who are preaching and teaching the truth. And most of them aren't in the big cathedrals. A lot of them aren't on our television. There are little small churches like this one. I think that's where revival is going to come. Little churches like this one scattered all around. He says he heals all your diseases. He sent them out. I'm not going to get started on that. I'm tempted to because it is such a powerful message that Christ wants us to have. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, verse 4. Remember, we, I, I preached on Psalm 91, I think the second week I was here. And that's another one of Psalms that was probably written by Moses rather than David. Uh, most scholars believe that. It, either way, it's written by the Holy Spirit of God. That's what it comes down to. But it's the, the premier psalm on being redeemed from destruction, of being protected. He that dwelleth, that's not somebody who's visiting, but he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. You see the personal pronouns. David knew this God was his. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. He guideth me. He prepares the table for me. He knew it was him and God. When you can get that, you've got it. Christianity is a relationship between you and God Almighty. Through Jesus Christ, it's full of life and power and joy and energy. I feel sorry for everybody who isn't me sometimes. i got more joy than I can handle. I wish I could get, bottle it and give it to somebody. And everybody can have it. You know, and, 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 and inner strength and inner vitality it doesn't come from me or genes or a good diet or working out at the gym. It comes from the Spirit of God. It comes from a new life, an abundant life. Yeah. And everybody can have that. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. That's somebody who traps birds. From the noise of the pestilence. That's COVID. It was embarrassing to me to watch the lack of faith in the church of Jesus Christ with COVID. Three-fourths of the church was hiding with their masks on under their beds at home. Thinking that God Almighty... A perfect Heavenly Father can't prevent you from a little virus? What an insult. What an insult. All right. Some of you are a little hurt by that. It's okay. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. But sometimes you get a shot and it hurts for a minute. You know? <laughs> but it makes you better. <laughs> Just think about so you, know, you have to have our faith. You think we're done with COVID? You, you got COVID-19. What about COVID-25, 26, and 27? You think there aren't bad people right now working on that stuff while we're sitting here? There are. You know, we have to have us as a church, as a body of believers, with strong faith, ready for when we get the next phone call, the next news flash in the television, the next thing on the front page of the paper that tells us there's some disaster. You know, his heart is steadfast. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. He's trusting in the Lord, it says. Uh, I'm, I'm going a lot slower here. than i I got to pick up the pace here. I'll have you home in time to kick off. <laughs> Think about that. That's in September, man. <laughs> but I'm not going to give you the next couple of weeks. I've got an extra hour to add. I'm, no, I'm not kidding. I'm not going to do that to you. But he shall cover with his wings. Under his wings thou shalt trust. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor by the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. That's the promise of God to you if you take it. And you're going to need to take it. You redeem with life all destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness. What a crown. The Stephanos and Diamata. Two kinds of crowns in the Greek in the New Testament. The uh, Stephanos was the crown for athletic events. The Diamata is the crown for royalty. The one that Christ wears. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness. Loving kindness is one of God's favorite words. In Jeremiah 31, 3. Therefore have I loved thee with, a, with, a, with an eternal love, and with loving kindness I have drawn thee. 
Loving kindness is a, is, is a wonderful word, chesed in Hebrew. And somebody asked a little boy once, what's the difference between kindness and loving kindness? He said, well, if I was hungry and you gave me a piece of bread, that would be kindness. But if you put peanut butter and jelly on it, that would be loving kindness. Now, I know I told you that before, but I'm a peanut butter and jelly fan, so I get that one. You know? <laughs> loving kindness. God is a loving kindness God and with tender mercies. Thy mercies are fresh every morning. They're new. We need them every morning. I needed God's mercies today. I'm, the more I study this book, the more I'm aware of my imperfections. The more I, I'm aware of how weak and frail and unworthy I am of what God has given me. But the more I get aware of that, the more he gives me. I don't understand it. I'm not arguing with it. <laughs> I'm glad to have his mercies. But he knows I desire to live a holy life. I desire to please him. And I pray often, look, don't let me say anything, think anything, be anything, do anything that casts any shadow upon the cause of Christ. And you should all be praying that as well. Because then we, we, we won't do anything that causes our brothers to stumble. Paul was able to say to those in him, who was talking to Greg about that today, that follow me even as I follow Christ. If we can say that, we're in good shape. Who satisfied thy mouth with good things. We don't be like that one. Now I looked it up just for fun. In the, uh, in the in the Jewish Bible, the Jewish Jewish translation, if you went into the synagogue, this is the scriptures you would read. It's a wonderful translation. All the 39 books of the Old Testament in different order than we have them, but they're all there. And when it says this, it says, "Who satisfy thy old age with good things?" I like that, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> I'm I'm all happy with that. In fact, I just read you Psalm 91. That six next. Uh, and this is applicable to this verse as well. The next verse, Psalm 92, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like the cedars in Lebanon. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be abundant and flourishing. I got it. Okay, I'm standing on that one. <laughs> Not that I'm old yet. I'll only be 80 next week. I'm looking forward to my 90th celebration. If God wills. My times are insane. I don't care. If I die tonight, I'm, I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. But I don't think I'm going to die tonight. I feel like I'm just getting started. That's how I feel. I feel like I've got years in front of me that are going to be spent in his service. I'm sure of it as I stand here. God is just good that way. You satisfy the mouth with good things. Well, you buy a car, you've got to have tires and wheels. You've got to have an engine and brakes. It's probably a good idea to have a windshield. That's necessary. You don't have to have leather seats. You don't have to have a moonroof. You don't have to have a, um, a CD system with 17 speakers. That's optional equipment. For you to live... You do not have to have taste buds. Optional equipment. But God gave you 9,000 taste buds so you can enjoy about 45,000 different flavors along with the scent and smell. He made you so that you can enjoy a good meal. Is there anybody here that doesn't enjoy eating? Please raise your hand. I want to pray for you. No, 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 no hands are up. We all love to eat, don't we? Because it tastes good. And that's, uh, he satisfies you with good things. He made us to be able to enjoy the creation he's, that he provide, he's provided for us. It's just so that that youth is renewed as the eagles. Well, the eagles have a way of molting. And every time they lose all their feathers, when they get their feathers back, they look better than they did before. The lifespan of an eagle around here is about 25 or 30 years. Back in Old Testament times, around 100 years, they lived a long time. So they had a long time. They were also powerful birds. And in Psalm 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall rise up as wings of eagles, shall walk and not be weary, and run and not be faint. You know, that word wait, by the way, there's three meanings for that in Hebrew. You can wait like you're waiting for a bus. You're sitting there doing nothing. You know, but you can wait on God patiently. You can wait like you wait on tables, you're working for him. Or the third meaning for the word wait there in that verse is embroidered. It's a word you use weaving, braiding. You can wait being embroidered, being woven into, abiding in the branch of Christ, being part of his life and his purpose. So however you want to wait, you will rise up on eagles' wings here, a youth renewed like the eagles. <clears throat> the Lord executed us righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his way to Moses. That's amazing. How did he do that? That's an aspect of our relationship with him that we need to remember. We have a Bible now. We can hold this book in our hands. And this is the most precious physical gift that God's given us on earth of objects, not people, is this book. It's the manufacturer's handbook. It's the roadmap to heaven. It's everything you will ever need. It tells you everything you need to know, not what you want to know. But it gives you the plan to live a good life, to be happy, to be healthy, to be wise, to be saved. It helps you to grow in wisdom and in knowledge and in power and grace. It's everything you need in this book. 
and it's why he's commanded us <clears throat> to study it. And sometimes we don't study it, we just we peruse through it. In Deut Deuteronomy 5, <clears throat> 24, uh, it says, he made known his ways unto Moses. Well, how did he do that? Moses didn't have a Bible to read, didn't have tracks, couldn't turn on the Christian radio station. But when God wants to get your attention, he'll get your attention. He still reserves the right to speak to you. And this is an aspect of our Christian walk that I learned for Christians, I know that, to know, to know. Three times in the 10th chapter of John, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. And in quietness and stillness, there's a comfort. We have too many radios on and earbuds and computers. And we don't, we don't, we've lost the, the, the secret of sacrament of silence, of being still and know that I am God, of going someplace and just being quiet for a while. And pray, speak his name, whisper his name, Jesus. 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 And be still and wait. You know how many times you'll hear the whisper? He never shouts. It's always a still small voice. But he wants to talk to every one of you here today. Every one of you. There's nobody in this room that's exempt. God loves every one of you. He wants to lead you that way. And what he whispers in your ear will never contradict what's in this book. You know, there used to be a lady at the church that, that uh, when I was saved, I was growing up, and she had a habit of running and telling everybody, God told me to tell you to do this, and God told me to tell you to do that. And I was always... I always missed her, but uh, then one day she picked up me. She says, Brother Bill, God told me to tell you to do this, and what I forget was what she told me to do. And I said, well, thank you, ma'am, and it says he tells me I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm able, you're able to hear for yourself sometimes. Yeah. Well, I have the wisdom of discernment of knowing when it's God speaking or not. He made known his ways. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Aren't you glad he doesn't have a quick temper? Peter the Great was the man who modernized Russia, one of the great leaders of all times. But his temper was volcanic. He murdered his own son in a fit of rage. And he was a incredible old man at the end of his life. He decried the fact that he could control an empire, but he couldn't control his own temper. Aren't you glad God doesn't step you out every time you step out of line? He's slow to anger. And he's merciful. What we need is mercy. I mean, we all need it. I need it. You need it. Mercy is not, is not giving you a, 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 a punishment that you deserve. Grace is giving you a reward that you don't deserve. Now, I love teachings on grace. Grace is the, nat the, nail the nails and the axles of the universe, Robert Louis Stevenson said. And it's a wonderful subject that needs to be taught, but you can't have a steady diet of just grace. Because grace is a one-way street. It's all about what God has done for you. It's all about receiving. We like to receive, we like to get. Faith is about giving back to him. Service and love is about giving back to him. So we have to be aware of his mercy. There's plenty of it. He's slow to anger, plenty of mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. That's a good thing. Because it used to be a line in the Newsboy song, if you don't get what you deserve, it's a real good thing. <laughs> I don't remember that. But sometimes, we don't, he doesn't punish us as we deserve. And I was reading, it was Ezra. If you're reading through the Daily Bread, you're reading Ezra. And what a remarkable story that is. By the way, God gave me a message to me about this church in Ezra and Nehemiah and people in this church and who Ezra is and who Nehemiah is and what, how he's going to build. That work stopped. For 15 years, it stopped. It didn't go forward. But it started again. We got a, a, a new building out there and it stopped. It's going to start again for the same purposes here. Amen. The same God is going to build that building. It's up to us to believe it and to move forward. Here a little, there, line upon line, get it done. It's, it's, uh, he says, I trembled at the words of the Lord of Israel. And Ezra says, oh my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face with thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our heads and our trespasses grown up. For thou, O God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this. There's that spirit here. That he doesn't treat me that way. And then he says, uh, <clears throat> So, as, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. It says, fear him here in verse 11. Verse 13, like a father feareth his children, so the Lord feareth them that fear him. Verse 17, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. Another thing the church of Christ I see around me in our world today needs is to have a good, healthy fear of God. They've lost mm -hmm. it. They treat God like a celestial Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. 
He's another good old boy member of the Sunday morning religion club. They don't realize he's God Almighty. He's holy. He's approachable, but he needs to have godly reverence for him. And he loves it when you have that reverence. Those that fear me, I will teach them my ways. He has mercy towards those that fear him. He tell you them that fear him. And you know, we, we say that isn't taught in the New Testament. Oh, yes, it is. It's all through the New Testament. Well, Jesus never feared God. Oh, yes, he did. What? Well, fear is reverence. This is Father's Day. My, my kids always used to tell me, that they, they know I love them. I tell them every day I love them. I pray with them, kiss them goodnight every night, tell them I love them. There's never been a day in my kids' nights I haven't told them how much I love them. Never let that day go by. But when I have to punish them, they don't like that. They're, they're, you know, the, the favorite thing was that my wife used to say, well, you better do this or I'll have, uh, you better behave yourself or I'll have your father punish you. Oh, man, we respect him out. Because I was in the Department of Discipline and she was in the Department of Mercy. But I loved them too much not to discipline them. <clears throat> and, uh, it's, not always, it's, it's not always easy, but you, you, we have to learn to have a reverence. Of, uh, one of the, there's five different words for fear. One of them is caution. It means you're, 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 you're dealing with God carefully. He's God you're talking to. Him. <coughs> not, not Santa Claus in a department store. You know, he's God. And another word for God means reverential awe. Another one just means downright fear. Remember when David was praying to bring the ark back and, and, and Isaiah touched it and he, he got, God killed him because he disobeyed God's law and just snapped him right out. And David says, it says in the Bible that David was afraid of the Lord that day. And there's nothing wrong with having a healthy fear. Um, Jesus says he learned that part of him so also Christ, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Hebrews 5, verse 7. Jesus had a reverential awe. He says, I love the Father in the Gospel of John. And he says in the Gospel of John, the Father loves me. He knew he loved his dad, he was dead, but he had a reverential fear. We need to get that back. And it needs to start from my folks. It needs to be taught. My people perish. For a lack of knowledge. The, uh, as far as the east is from the west, verse 12, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Aren't you glad he didn't say as far as the north is from the south? Because there's a north pole and there's a south pole. You get to the north pole, you can't go any farther north. You get to the south pole, you can't get any farther south. But no matter how far east you go, there always is east. And no matter how far west you go, there's always west. You're never going to come to the end of it. That's why it says, as far as the east is, is west. He's removed that. In five places, it says he can keep you from sin. You can be kept by the power of God. Those who want to be kept. And as uh, verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord hath pity upon them that fear him. I remember one day when my, I never, some days you remember your kid's childhood, but one day when I was still getting ready to go to work and my son was up, he was three years old. And you could tell, I could tell when he came out of his room that he was got out of bed on the wrong side. And his mother had to speak to him about four or five times, and she just rolled her eyes like, what kind of days is it going to be? He was just, and he never had days like that. I mean, where did this come from? He was always a sweet little boy, but for some reason, he was contentious, he was disobedient, he was ornery. And uh, I came home, and uh, I had to spank him. He, he really stepped out of line, and, and I had to spank him. And when I did, I told him why. I told him I love him, and he should be a good boy, and he should honor his mother and do what she says, and I spanked him, and I hugged him and kissed him, and told him I loved him, and I'm sorry I had to do that, I hope I never have to do that again, but you need to obey the work of God. And, and um, uh, he had a hard day, and he went to sleep, and I went to look at him. <clears throat> I like to, used to like to go in and look at all my kids before I went to bed when they were sleeping. You know, my daughter Susie, she'd be arms and legs all over the place, blankets wrapped around her, pillows off the floor. <laughs> Mary was just like this. And then went into sleep. <laughs> And he was lying there after this hard day, <coughs> and he had his little teddy bear cuddled under his chin, and I could still see the tears in his eyes. And I pity him. I love him. But I just pity him. It's not his fault. It's the sin that's in him. He got it from me. I got it from my father. My father got all the way back to act. We all have it in us. We all have that tendency just to have a bad day and do bad things. Because I love him so much, I pity him. 
And I thank God that the blood of Christ is applied to forgive my son from his mm -hmm. sins. And you know, all, kid, all my kids are saved. We're all serving God today. And I thank God for that. But God pities us too. He's a loving father. When he has to correct us, he corrects us as a father. A loving father corrects his child, not as a judge punishes a criminal. There's a huge difference when he has to chide us. For he knoweth our framework, he remembers that we are a dust. He knows how frail we are. The little boy learned in Sunday school, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And uh, he came home with that message that was really on his mind, ashes to ashes, dust. The dust we cover, the dust we return. He goes up to his bed and he's getting, changing his clothes, looking for his shoes. They come screaming down the steps. And his mother says, what's wrong? He says, Mom, I just looked under the bed and somebody's coming to Roman. <laughs> Dust bunnies, get it? Under the bed? Yes. Never mind. I'll try not to forgive him that Lord. I'll try not to forgive him. He knows that we are dust. Dust is a fragile thing. Have you ever gone to a camp? And people are, we're, we're so creative, like our father creative. We love to paint, draw, write, use it, sculpture, architects, make things out of crafts. I've never seen people make all kinds of sculptures out of hubcaps and stuff. Have you ever seen anybody make anything out of dust? You can't, there's not much you can do with it. You know, but take a dust bunny, and what are you going to do with that thing? Spray it with hairspray and paint it? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Some people think that. You never do home up with dust. Um, as for man, his days are as the flower of the field, so he nourisheth. For the wind passeth over and is gone, and a place rough shall know it no more. In Job 7 and 20, it says, The places that knew him shall know him no more. The eyes that saw him will see him no more. Never come to your life you have an empty chair, please kid. Somebody who's sitting at your Thanksgiving table and they're gone. Mm. And their, their chair will never be sat in. Their favorite chair, the, the, the things they touch, the things that were part of them. He knows the, the limits of our mortality. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto his children's children, to such as keep his covenant to those that remember his commandments to do them. Again, it's the important thing of trying to obey God. I mean, Again, I love the teachings of grace, but grace is not a ticket for disobedience. Grace is not an excuse. Well, we're, we're under God's grace, and our sins are forgiven, so let's just do what we want. No. We are still obliged to, to obey the law. It's not a hard thing. It's not, it's not, it's, there's no suffering in doing that. There's, there's joy in trying to live a holy life. There's joy in holiness. There's purity. There's power in purity. There's peace in purity. There's pleasure in purity. When you get to the point in your life where you feel like you can look God in the eye and and you know I'm clean before the field, but you know I'm trying. I'm pressing on. I'm pushing forward. I'm believing. There's a joy in just making an effort. It's not a hard thing. It doesn't make you a, a legalist. You know, it's, it's not being a legalist. It's, it's, it's respecting God enough to realize, which is thou shalt not lie. You don't lie. That's a Ten Commandments. That means you don't cheat on a test. You don't fib, exaggerate, because it, it hurts God. You don't steal. Thou shalt not steal. You know, you don't commit adultery with your body or with your eyes. But men have a problem with this. You have to learn to keep your eyes pure. These are struggles all men have. There was a thing in the, I think it was in, it may have been in Daily Bread, uh, where it was a focus group for, for senior men, you know, men over 80, and all of them were having problems with lust at 80 years old. So it, there's, there's solutions to all these things. Uh, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. And in the age we're in, that's a nice reminder. God's in control of this entire universe. There's not one atom, not one subatomic sub particle anywhere in this universe that's not under the control of Almighty God. He is sovereign. So you can find peace in that. You don't have to worry about who wins the next election, or our economy, mm -hmm. or terrorism. God's in control. Yeah. And if you're under the shadow of his wings, you're safe. He either prevents, permits, or promotes. He prevents it from happening, he permits it to happen, or he promotes it. But he's in control. And when you get that concept in you about the sovereignty of God, it gives you peace in this world. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be afraid of whatever's on the front page of the page, paper tomorrow. Like I said, we were talking about what Jesus said in John 14, verse 3, I will come again. That moment is real. He's coming back. And when that seventh trumpet sounds, and the angel says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Christ and of his Lord, all these corrupt politicians are out of a job. All these people are gone. It's stopped. It's over. 
And that's coming. That's inevitable. It's coming. And I find that in this verse. He rules over all. Bless the Lord. He, how am I doing time now? Oh, my goodness gracious. I guess I better wrap this up. I'm having so much fun up here. I forgot to fly. <laughs> time just flies by when you're having a good time, don't you know? <laughs> anyway. Uh, bless the Lord, all ye his angels that excel in his strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. This psalm again begins with, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and it ends with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. We have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Amen. Our sins are forgiven. We have good things to eat. We have the promise of eternal life, protection. We've been redeemed. We've been justified, sanctified, set apart, regenerated. We have all these wonderful things that are ours. But we need to cultivate the sense that we've got these things. You know, Spurgeon wrote that gratitude is the wellspring of all other virtues. And I love Spurgeon. I love his poetic. He closed the, the truths of Scripture with beautiful language. He's just a poet. And the first time I heard that, I thought, well, that sounds good, but I'm not sure I, I get that. Gratitude is the wellspring of all other virtues. And I thought, well, I like the sound of that, but I'm not sure I can teach that, because I'm not sure how that works. I don't, I don't see that. And I kept it on the back burner for about three years. And as time went by, and as continued studying the Bible, it began to form to me, I began to see that he's right. I don't have time to explain it to you now. But the wellspring of all of the virtues is gratitude. Being grateful to God, it keeps you from discontent. For one thing, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm content. I'm, a, I'm the happiest person I know. There's nothing that I covet. Nothing that, I, that I, somebody else has got that I want. I wouldn't trade places with any man in the world. My life is just rich with the things that really count. And I'm so grateful. And I begin by thanking him. So that's how this ends. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Father, thank you for these words for this man like David, a man after God's own heart. You say that in the Old Testament. You say it again in the New. He was a man like your own heart. May we have the heart of David and learn to see your hand in everything, to see your goodness, to take a daily inventory of your blessings and not to forget them. We tend to forget, Lord, forgive us when we do. Forgive me when I do. <coughs> Make us mindful of the rich heritage that is ours, what we've been saved from and what we have been saved for, and the goodness that we, we have that will attend to us all the days of our life and, and really increase when we cross the river. Bless these truths of us, may they abide in our hearts and bear forth fruit in our love for you. In Jesus' name.